master data is so crucial for the interoperability and the integration of enterprise data. So we have a focused effort on making sure that master data is available so that as we eliminate the point to point data sharing and the master data is easily available to create that 360 degree view of a healthcare provider as an example. Welcome to the Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Sometimes data's worth can feel intangible, but in the healthcare and life sciences sectors, the stakes are clear. Having the right data at the right time can be the difference between life and death. While these industries have historically been slower to change, current global health needs and the technological possibilities to meet them are creating opportunities for more rapid transformation. Today's guests are Mahmoud Majid, Managing Partner at ZS Associates, and Murali Verdachalam, the Head of Enterprise Data and Analytics at Gilead Sciences. ZS Associates is a firm dedicated to helping its customers, many of who are in the healthcare industry, develop great products by way of effective analysis, use of technology, and strategy implementation. And Gilead Sciences is a company focused on increasing worldwide health by developing medicines to help people with life-threatening diseases. On this episode of The Data Chief, Mahmoud and Murali share their fascinating perspectives on digital transformation in healthcare and the ways that patient outcomes are improving with data and analytics. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Morley Mahmood, I'm so excited to have both of you on the Data Chief. And normally, we I start this by asking, where are you joining from? But as you both recently visited some exotic places, tell us, Mahmood, where did you just return from? Um, you know, I had uh, for the two wonderful trips recently, and uh, I think the what, the best one to describe is when I went to Maldives and I just came back a few months back. Um, I've never been there before, but it was amazing to be in the middle of ocean and you know not just about the the, the beach and the surroundings, but what I what I saw underneath the ocean was just outstanding. I mean, that's a lifetime experience that I wish um, you know anybody who who can, we definitely should do that. Yeah, that's great. I love that. And as my some listeners know, my daughter is a marine scientist. So of course we get beautiful pictures every week of what mm-hmm. is beneath the ocean, but I've never been there. And morally, where have you just returned from? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I went to uh, Foster City. That's where Gilead Sciences is headquartered. I took a day off to go play golf at Pebble Beach and uh, it was an amazing experience, best experience ever in terms of golf. Uh, I hope I can do that at least twice a year going forward. So. Oh, yeah. You have to make time for these things. And I know the golfers around the world are picturing themselves playing there. Just a beautiful course with the ocean in the background. I once got to stand on that beach pre-COVID, while Aaron Rodgers from the Green Bay Packers was in a tournament above. So I was just a a beach and a shoreline uh, distance from him. So, so, so we like, we all like golf and travel data and healthcare and life sciences. I can't think of a more important use case. And Mahmoud, you've been in this industry for so long with ZS as one of the premier partners serving so many life sciences organizations. Tell us a little bit about ZS and your role there. Sure, thank you. So, you know, ZS is a unique firm that brings uh, business strategy, technology, and AI and data science together in a very, very unique way. And, you know, it's a very fascinating story. Our founders uh, started the company, two founders from Kellogg School of Business. And at that point, they were actually, um, you know, doing some research. And as, as they were researching, somehow uh, life sciences and healthcare executives you know, got hold of them and, and they liked their problem solving techniques. And that's kind of, you know, evolved to be a, a firm, which is, you know, about 12,000 people globally. 
What unique about ZS is that everything we do is all focused on data and AI. In fact, I started in the firm about 23, 24 years back. And you know, my focus was all how do I really um, you know, do analysis to kind of inform the, the strategy that we used to do. And of course, now our, our focus is much broader. So we are able to really bring some very unique aspects of um, data and AI as, as a core to drive these digital transformation for our clients. Uh, my role at ZS is to lead our digital and technology practice. So I look across the industry, identify new capabilities, new services, new innovations, and really work with our clients and our and our other practices to really build those innovation and scale them. Yeah, and if I think about the scale of ZS, how many data and analytics professionals do you have? Um, about seven to 8,000 people globally. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. That's a lot yeah. dedicated on one specific industry vertical. So, Morley, you have had a long career in the digital and analytics space, but only recently joined Gilead. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, Cindy, I, I worked for IBM for a very long time. I joined IBM right out of my master's uh, after I finished my master's degree in the uh, mid 90s. And I worked for IBM for 25 years and I joined Gilead only last year. But in IBM, I worked in seven or eight different divisions. The last two jobs that I had in IBM was with the global chief data office and then uh, with Watson Health. And in the middle of the pandemic, I wanted to join, uh, continue to work in a purposeful industry, uh, healthcare. So I got this great opportunity to work for Gilead to lead their enterprise data and analytics function. So I took this role uh, March of last year. So it's been a little over a year. Uh, it's been a great uh, journey in the last year. Um, I, my team is in the forefront of enabling Gilead teams to derive value from data. Uh, my teams are working on a data and AI platform for Gilead. Uh, they manage the analytics uh, tool portfolio for Gilead. And also uh, there are teams who are focused on data and analytics in the development space, in the PDM, which is pharmaceutical development and manufacturing, but also for sales and marketing and um, finance, HR, corporate operations uh, domains as well. So I have a great scope. I am enjoying my uh, role in Gilead. Yeah. So if I think about this journey of going from a vendor to, let's say, an end customer where you're actually um, using data and analytics to have a bigger impact. Now, I would say from Gilead, probably in the last two years, Remdesivir is probably one of the more household names that we associate with Gilead. And yet this role, the CDO role is new for Gilead. So if I think about the differences across industries, let's say, financial services, the CDO role existed more than 10 years ago. And the differences in maturity between financial services and healthcare life sciences couldn't be more extreme. Do you think COVID has been a forcing function for life sciences and healthcare to catch up or innovate in analytics? What do you each think here? Well, I certainly think uh, COVID is one of the driving uh, uh, forces, but uh, even from a, uh, and you're, uh, you're right, in terms of life sciences, it's a really regulated industry. Uh, there's a lot of compliance related uh, activities that need to happen. That's why traditionally life sciences, healthcare industries, the companies have uh, depended on on-prem technologies and we are actually migrating to the cloud. But I will also say that Gilead's ambition of developing 10 plus transformative therapies by 2030, uh, that has been a driving force as well. So there's a tremendous focus on data management and adapting the AI across Gilead, across all domains. So yeah. uh, certainly, and I will let uh, Mahmoud. Uh, go ahead, well, Mahmoud. yeah, or, or maybe because I just want to clarify something. So 10 plus transformative therapies by 2030. That's in eight years. I think I had read um, prior to you know the last two years, the average time to market for a new therapy was 18 years. Correct me if I'm wrong. You, you two would know the stats better, yeah, it's, but it's, that uh, just shows the accelerated pace of innovation, I think. Uh, absolutely. Anywhere from eight to 18 years. Uh, you know, 
right? And that speed. But even if you look at the COVID vaccine, right? They actually, for the first time ever, a effective vaccine was developed uh, by the pharma industry in a matter of months for the first time ever. Usually a yeah. vaccine takes about five years. So and I think that's the power of having a data, uh, scaling data management and applying uh, data science on it to develop those therapies much faster. Yeah, for sure. And I think the pace of um, that particular innovation is what has frightened or made some of the non data people nervous. We understand why it was possible, but maybe the lay person has not. So Mahmoud, what do, what do you think? And, and both of you push back if you disagree with me that I'm saying this industry um, has been a little bit behind the curve yeah. in AI and analytics. Yeah. So I think from my perspective, there is no question that the industry has a lot to catch up. I think it's a very data rich industry. And it has just, I would say it just started exploiting data. There is way too much. And if I, if I just give you some specific examples, uh, you know, the whole aspects of the, the data that is used uh, primarily is in the medical claims data. And now people are really expanding into you know, genomics, proteomics, but, and, and, you know, social determinants. So the, the health equity or the data application is just getting much wider than it used to be. The data, there are so much data that is available and it's now converging. So this yeah. convergence of data is also creating a lot of potential and opportunity. The advancements of technology, the cost of technology going down, the advancements of analytical techniques to your earlier point, regulations, right? And then the interoperability requirements to work in an ecosystem are all the triggers of why pharma companies like sciences, healthcare companies are really moving towards much more towards this whole data and digital acceleration. Now, yeah. you know, um, you are right that the research suggests, you know, that the, the whole time it takes to develop the drug is, is between eight to 18 years. We saw the example of Moderna, right? That, that, but again, it's a, it's a completely different platform. But Cindy, the last two years have been very, very critical for our, you know, the, what, what it has done is it, you know, um, industries like healthcare have advanced at least five years. So this actually drug development also is now gaining a lot of newer and creative ways because now you are able to you know, look at data and do a lot of these things that were all only possible in, in labs and experiments. So I think it has just started. There's, there's way much potential out there. And I think companies who are really taking data as a core capability to drive value are really going to be in the, in the front and center of this transformation. Yeah, so thank you, Mahmoud. It, you, you did mention something, a couple points, that it's uh, the claims data historically mm -hmm. has been more mature. And this just seems so backwards to me that we're going to have the payers be more sophisticated than the providers. So hopefully we're balancing that out. But do we all need to work maybe more with the regulators? Are we feeling like regulation is, is slowing innovation down? Yeah. Do we need to have that multi-pronged approach? Yeah. So, so I feel, see, the focus of um, healthcare being shoppable. So what I mean by that, right? Consumerism in healthcare is just starting. Right now, only 12% of healthcare is shoppable. And I think the future of healthcare is patient will have much more options and choices that they can actually you know, make these many choices they're not able to make today. And what that means is the interoperability requirements for patient data to be shared across the ecosystem is going to put a lot of pressure. Right now, I think regulatory maybe. Um, you know, regulatory is a, is a, is a concern for many people yes. and regulatory doesn't say that you cannot use patient data or PAI data. Regulatory says that you have to disclose and follow the processes and be aware of how are being using it and be, 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 be vocal about it. So people know how their data is being used. So I feel like this is going to just get much broader usage and the, the focus on handling data in a regular compliant, secure way and providing interoperability and being exchanging through secured APIs is going to be a core requirement for many companies. 
Yeah, interoperability, exchanging of data across the whole value chain is key. So Morley, you're, you've just come up or celebrated your one year at Gilead. Tell us what are you currently focused on? What are the um, initial priorities? Yeah, happy to share. Uh, so Cindy, um, after I joined Gilead, I noticed there were a lot of different teams working on siloed uh, efforts on data analytics. So now we have a holistic approach of enabling a data-driven culture at Gilead. It's not a cliche. Uh, it's a, we do have a holistic approach. I'm creating those the partnerships with the business stakeholders on executing on that holistic approach. So we are trying to disrupt the culture. For example, uh, you know, we are, we are dependent, a lot of teams are dependent on uh, a central BI team to create reports. Uh, we are trying to disrupt that culture by enabling self-serve analytics. And oh, by the way, uh, we use uh, we, we position ThoughtSpot as that uh, strategic tool to enable self-serve analytics. Then we are actually, you know, uh, looking at our own strategy. Do we have the right data and AI strategy for Gilead? As part of that, do we have the right data and AI platform as an example? So, uh, you know, I partner with Mahmood, uh, ZS, we partner with ZS in terms of building the data platform. Then we are looking at our technology adoption. You know, are we, uh, you know, there are a lot of on-prem tools and warehouses today, can we move to the cloud? So we have a, a, a roadmap to move to the cloud. Then we're looking at, can we make trusted data available? Because um, people have to have inherent trust in the data, otherwise people will not use it. So you're making sure there's good quality data available as we build the data platform. Uh, we also look at data literacy. Uh, that's so important uh, because people have to know how to work with data. They have to know the context for the data. They have to know what is the you know what is the data. They have to, they are, you have to have description behind the data. So we are investing in a data catalog as an example, but not just a data catalog, but also a great user experience where Gilead team members can go and browse through a catalog and with a few clicks can get access to the data. But also all of this is important, but. Again, uh, not uh, last but not least, data governance is also important, right? So we're focused on data governance. Uh, I would say even platform governance, but also having the right guiding principles for team to collaborate and consume that data. So it is a holistic approach with the right partnerships with the business stakeholders. We are creating some metrics to measure that. Uh, so that's what we are starting to execute on uh, to uh, drive that uh, data-driven culture at Gilead. I'm saying this is very consistent with what I'm seeing across the industry, that many companies are what I call walking towards this digital native operating model. And this digital native operating model implies that data, AI, process, integrations, analytics are your binding capabilities. So instead of sitting into functions and being very limited, now they are actually being used across the enterprise and really fueling innovation, fueling scaling much, much faster. Not everybody is there. Small companies is much easier, right? They start with that mindset, like Moderna's of the world. They were a you know digital native company, so they could start that way. But many large companies, right, are also now bringing data and AI together as a as a as a as a core integral capability across the organization. Similar to what Gilead did, right? They brought data as a core, and Murli was able to stitch it together. And that is the first step to create this transformation. Now, for large companies, usually you need to take steps, and we are seeing people are really taking these steps in kind of walking towards this net digital native operating model. Yeah. Right. So, so thank you both for you covered a lot there. So, I want to unpack a couple points. So, um, Morley, first you said data driven culture. It's not a cliche. It's not a cliche, but it is hard to get to. So, to share a statistic, I'll quote from Randy Bean author of Fail Fast, Learn Faster, um, only 24% of organizations have created that data-driven culture and his fact base goes heavily to healthcare, life sciences, and financial services. So it's not a cliche, but it is hard. And I often say that technology and culture are two sides of the same proverbial coin. It's hard to create a data-driven culture on a legacy technology stack that is inflexible and brittle. So you, you both mentioned this transformation, moving to cloud 
and then breaking down the silos. Can you share a little bit more about how you're making that happen? Like what, yeah. what is your modern data stack definition? Yeah. And of course, thank you for mentioning ThoughtSpot. We're thrilled uh, to have you as a customer, but yeah. um, what's that modern data stack look like? Yeah, first I want to acknowledge what you said. Uh, I agree with you that culture transformation is extremely difficult. Uh, there are many, many, many facets to it, including change management, skills, and things like that. But coming back to the second part of the question, modern data stack is one of our um, uh, adoption uh, approaches to managing data. So it's a set of tools that we have um, uh, adopted to for data for sorry for data ingestion, uh, data transformation, and data consumption. So our modern data stack, data stack can, consists of tools to uh, modern data pipelines to ingest data, uh, transform the data, and visualize that data. We also have a, a since we have a lot of data warehouses on prem and we're starting to adopt a lot of AWS services on the cloud, uh, we have multiple data pipelines to ingest data. So for example, we have data pipelines to ingest data into on-prem Oracle database. We have a different uh, pipeline to ingest data into uh, Redshift as an example. But data, without moving the data, can an end user access the data? So that's where we have adopted Starburst, which is a federated query engine that sits on top of Oracle and Redshift as example of data and many other technologies. So we have a Starburst layer sitting on top. And above that, our strategic tool of choice for self-serve analytics is ThoughtSpot. So to me, a modern data stack is the ETL pipelines that ingest data and transform the data, a, a, a federated query engine that can actually provide access to the data sitting in different storage technologies. Uh, but also a visualization, a search tool um, like ThoughtSpot at the forefront of uh, enabling self-serve analytics. So that's the modern tech stack that we are trying to enable at Gilead. Yeah, thank you for sharing that level of detail. Now, some people, Starburst Data was one of the early vendors to lean into the concept of the data mesh, which some organizations, and I would say old school mindsets, are afraid of this concept. They're like, no, single data warehouse, single source of truth. Um, so one, Mahmoud, let me know, are people afraid of this or are they embracing these yeah. newer concepts? So I think so. everybody, I feel like there's potential in this concept, but notice I'm using the word approach and concept first yes. because it's a it's a distributed architecture design principle of how do you really manage and you know it's very easy to say yeah data should be owned by domain now what does that actually mean let's look at an example of real world data in pharmaceutical company at least 10 to 15 business functions have use and they may own real world data so it's it's leaving it that way will be very difficult but when you bring this whole domain construct around it what does real world data mean for clinical for supply chain for for commercial, for real world, all of these components come together. I think the technologies that Murli talked about, you know, giving access, democratizing access, bringing much more focus on sharing data, accessing data, and keeping it fluid for people who can use it with, with the right sort of governance and, and, and policies. That's the trick. And that requires deeper domain packaging and domain understanding of each of the industry. Otherwise, this becomes a, a very conceptual conversation. Yeah. yeah, well, I like the word that you, I like that you distinguished between concepts versus it's not just one technology you can buy. And I, I find, and I don't think it will be a buzzword. I think it's a new way of thinking and working. And we originally selected the Data Mesh, the book from uh, Jamak Dagani, as a must read back in August 20, uh, August 2021, the she had been releasing chapters as she was writing and it just uh, finished about a few weeks ago. And it is it has continued now to be a number one bestseller on Amazon. So I do think it's more than a buzz. I think it is a new way of working, but there is that fear. How do we keep, let's say, a consistent view of patient or maybe a consistent view of a particular 
drug um morally what do you think of this how do we how do we ensure that agility domain expertise but also the consistency yeah so uh, i'll answer the the first part of your question about data mesh and then i'll come to i i, I know you're referring to master data uh, i'll come to that next but in terms of data mesh i agree with um, mamood it is an approach uh, that we have also adopted uh, uh, besides what mamood uh, talked about uh, taking an approach of data as a product where mm-hmm. there are certain things that we have to accomplish where you know, data has to be discoverable secure interoperable so we are we are trying to adapt that as well and uh, that's how data can be shared across the enterprise right if data is discoverable uh, the other one is also we are self serve data infrastructure is another guiding principle of data mesh so we are taking the approach of making sure that data ingestion capabilities are available so that the domain teams can use those data ingestion capabilities to ingest data they're not dependent on a central uh, data engineering team uh, but last but not least with data mesh another guiding principle is the federated computational governance so uh, governance is very important so what are those global policies and what are those local policies what are the interoperability standards that are established by the global uh, team all of that is important so we are certainly taking that approach uh we are definitely seeing value in it we have still it's a journey we still have a long way to go uh we started with one use case and we're going to build on it uh, in the second half of the year uh coming back to your question about uh, the master data question that you asked about at least in gilead we have point to point data sharing so master data is so crucial uh for the interoperability and the integration of enterprise data so we have a focused effort on making sure that master data is available so that as uh, we eliminate the point to point data sharing and the master data is easily available to create that 360 degree view of a uh, healthcare provider as an example so we are certainly focused on a hub and spoke approach of making master data available and even with that uh, we are taking a data mesh approach we are just embarking on the journey uh, we are starting with product master data uh, and then we are going to go to other business entities um the you know and we have a road map for that yeah thank thank you so we've shared a lot about the how the modern tech stack but this all gets back to why the business outcomes or patient outcomes um and and it's about getting to those that value faster in a more agile way can either of you share a specific story or example of how um modern data analytics and ai is delivering these outcomes i think the the evolution of how you think about data as a how do you create value with data how do you capture value with data has been evolving at least in the in the life sciences area so now the 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 the, the ecosystem has been quite sophisticated where you know and again talking about the ai use cases you actually can predict the likelihood of a prescriber writing a prescription writing a script before a script is being written you can actually prescribe you can actually predict a patient dropping a therapy before it actually drops or you can actually predict a plan changing their formulary status before it actually happens so that is already happening so and and many of our clients are actually leveraging the the advancements of data and ai to for example in the first example that i talked about right how do you send your rep sales person to the right target to the right physician at the right time and at the right location and you know all these are what we call dynamic targeting how are you able to really intervene as the patient journeys are going through and then provide the right sort of you know guidance or or interventions for patients so that way they can maintain the therapies uh, at gilead you know in 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 partnership with with merly as he as Gilead started to modernize the technology platform we were also looking at what does that and you know we started with commercial and commercial was looking to really you know improve or engage the, the enhance their entire customer experience right in the context of 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 digital marketing and, and and many of the other areas how do you really leverage analytics to create differentiation for your product in the market so using those as the value equation we were able to really um achieve multiple things a how do you really bring this whole um, you know elevate the the role of data into the organization so we only talked about those things b yeah. how do you 
um, re you know, reduce all the cost that goes in with managing the infrastructure or the legacy, you know, uh, a lot of technical debt that has been, that was there. So by bringing them on the cloud, there are significant, significant cost savings, you know, in the, in the magnitude of 30 to 50% cost savings in terms of how do you manage, how do you govern, how do you, you know, kind of maintain your data, but also any new engagements that we are taking in terms of building newer components, newer capabilities, the, the, the opportunity was, was significant. And the third one is by, by bringing data on the cloud, by bringing analytics on the cloud, by modernizing the platform, by maintaining certain, you know, uh, timeframes for, for mergers and acquisitions uh, that we were also able to identify significant upside potential on, on the effectiveness of, of the, of the products that, that Gilead is, is driving in the marketplace. Yeah. So I just want to reinforce that. So there were two sides of those business outcomes. One is actually the ultimate goal, the patient therapies or getting the drugs to the right or the prescriptions to the right doctor, to the right patient, um, and ensuring the good therapies. But it, it was also on the cost side of delivering yeah. the data and analytics. And I haven't often heard this, 30 to 50% cost savings by operating in the cloud. More often what I hear is that cloud would also enable the degree of analytics that was not possible on premises, whether it's the elastic compute to run those mm -hmm. um, AI models or the level of detail that you actually want to analyze. So um, those those are two really yeah. good benefits. Go ahead, Morley. Yeah, I think, uh, Cindy, the convergence of data, AI and cloud, uh, when we have a lot of enterprise data on the cloud uh, and we're able to apply AI and machine learning on top of it, it yields special use cases that was never before possible because data was always in silos, right? Mm -hmm. And the scale of the cloud lets us to work on uh, data, petabyte scale of data. So it certainly deals hundreds of use cases. Yeah, yeah. So next best action, or I call it insight to action. And mm -hmm. we've all been in the space for so long. I, and I wrote in the 2022 trends that now because of the cloud, because of open APIs between these apps, it finally is possible or a reality. But it comes back to people. None of this is possible without the people reskilling, upskilling, um, how do how do you make this happen? So um, maybe Morali, let's start with you from a, a Gilead specific viewpoint. How are you upskilling and reskilling your people? Um, uh, upskilling and reskilling is absolutely important, like you said, right? Uh, whether it's data mesh approach or cloud, uh, a different set of skills are needed. Uh, so yes, definitely we are upskilling and reskilling our people. We are partnering with AWS. Uh, we have a learning path for our uh, team members, uh, but also we are hiring experienced people who have worked in other uh, industries in terms of automation, DevOps, machine learning, ML ops, um, and data scientists as well. But very importantly, Cindy, not just skills, right? These are very important skills to adopt cloud technologies, uh, what I mentioned uh, for data management and data science but how do we organize those skills, right? So we have a cross-functional squad uh, where we would have people who are experienced in the full stack data management, but also a DevOps engineer, a domain specialist, working together, uh, applying those skills to actually um, uh, for ingest data faster and transform the data faster, but also consume that data. Yeah, so I like that you use the word squad. I'm seeing many, well, many innovative companies using this concept or term of a squad that is um, cross-skilled. There's still, are you encounter, encountering any power in politics? Who owns the headcount for these squads? Um, well, they, they are absolutely, uh, but uh, there's a, there's a definitely a shift in mindset that is required. Um, a few squads do have virtual members from other teams as part of the squad, but if everybody is embracing agile approaches to uh, developing software or uh, for data management, it's much easier. Uh, there have been instances of resistance, but um, not as much lately. So 
Uh, definitely, it's a, a, by, by the way, the squad approach is what was pioneered by Spotify a few years yeah. ago. So we are trying to uh, copy that model in a way and try to take that approach. Yeah, yeah, great. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. Mahmood, you've got thousands of professionals to upskill and reskill. How do you yeah. make that happen on such a magnitude? Yeah, in fact, it's a... It's a question that a lot of our clients are asking, right? Because talent is the holy grail of digital transformation or you know, uh, scaling data AI capabilities. So the way we are thinking about this is in this modern ecosystem, you know, this digital ecosystem, um, we are looking at us into these three broad categories of people and the skills, right? One is deep digital and tech capabilities or skills. How do you really, and, and things that Morley talked about, but also, also focus on emerging technologies that are really now coming in and disrupting the businesses in a big and significant way. So how do you really build a path for, for people who are, you know, uh, looking at one technologies to really have them be a boundary spanner, right? And not just thinking about technology only, but also think about the two other buckets that I, that I would like to highlight. The second one is this business acumen and thinking about business process, understanding the business models and how does really technology impact the business or what opportunities does technology has to amplify the, the scale and scope of the business that is out there. The third one is this new ways of working, which is a lot more focused on innovation, agile, product development, product mindset, critical thinking, you know, thinking. It's a very different way. A lot of product companies you talked about, Spotify and, you know, they have a very different model than traditional model, which was very, very waterfall. So I feel like, you know, bringing this deep digital and tech business acumen and strategy and innovation or new ways of working is, is really the, the new combination. So we are really working with our, um, with our teams and for leaders, we have actually established some broad digital leadership programs and in partnership with leading uh, universities. And, and develop those customized programs so they can see how other industries and other companies, what good looks like, what to do and what not to do, to, to kind of learn from those. For our, for our teams, we have developed um, Digital and Technology University where we are very, very deep focus on learning and scaling those capabilities. So this becomes the ways of working. But we've also built a digital literacy program for the entire firm. And, you know, that's where we feel it's not just about people that focus on digital needs to learn digital. It's for everybody has to understand, has to have the level one conversation. So how do you really build that and how do you gamify that so that way people can actually, um, you know, get get used to these things and, and, and learn from it. So that's kind of yeah. a, a very quick synopsis of what we are doing at, at, at GS. Yeah. So a couple of points in there. I love that you're emphasizing business acumen. If, yeah. if I were to say that the data science programs, many of them, not all of them, but many of them have failed to address that side of the skilling, um, is it, I guess I would ask both of you, do you agree or disagree with that point? And depending if you agree or disagree, what can we do about that as an industry profession to make sure we're not just graduating coders who don't know how to apply this stuff in a business context? I think in my personal opinion, Cindy, I think the domain expertise is what you're referring to, right? Data scientists yes. do require yeah. that. I think uh, data scientists have to work in the business units, not in central IT teams. Uh, and gain that experience because I'm having the knowledge of business process, how the business works uh, and gaining the domain knowledge is absolutely crucial in developing good machine learning algorithms. So uh, I would say experiences in the business units, uh, in different business units, uh, I think that's what I would say as a necessary step for data scientists. Yeah. So embedding them, yeah. Embedding. And some of the universities I work with now or serve on their advisory boards are trying to make sure that there's some of that domain expertise being taught as part of the curriculum. Um, yeah. the, the other thing you mentioned, Mahmoud, the, the third uh, pillar, the new ways of working. And interestingly, the World Economic Forum has critical thinking as mm -hmm. one of the top new skills. So you see the shifts in time yeah. that's changing. Are you also seeing some of, let's say, the softer skills like communication, 
facilitation or another data leader said to me, it's about grit and resilience because of the pace of change. Yeah. I think communication is storytelling, synthesizing, because in this world, in this you know hyper digital world we are, everybody has all the information on their fingertips. How do you tell the story in a very compelling way? Um, and, and you know, how do you kind of make this work in in this new ways of working? Um, I think the the role of digital IT teams is changing from just focusing on doing systems to be an entrepreneur, to be innovator, to be thinking about outcome outcomes to be thinking about relationship management to be thinking about you know looking ahead what does that actually mean business users may give high level vague ideas how do you take it forward and how do you really kind of think of it in a very different way so that's the skill what i call in, in our world i call it consulting skills right mm. and that is what is a unique and very very important area which you know in, in the past we may look at somebody who is a great data scientist and you know they may be amazing in algorithm, but if they cannot fit into this broader ecosystem and communicate, articulate, and, and show the value, they will struggle, right? So, yeah. so, so this whole package, what I call, you know, creative, critical thinking, creative ways of working, I call it consulting skills, are very, very critical for, for, for these roles because you are explaining to business, you're embedding, to Murli's point, you're embedding data science or AI into a business process, you're disrupting that. Nobody would like to change that unless you are able to clearly show the value of how this is going to be better. Yeah, That's where yeah. it's important. And change management is hard. <laughs> and, and I do like the use of gamification mm -hmm. to encourage or foster this change management. Can you be more specific on how you're applying gamification? So, you know, the, the talent pool that we are hiring you know, is, uh, is is a much younger age than, for example, me. And, you know, if, if you look at how my kids learn, right, they are all on YouTube and that's how they learn. So there is all social community sharing. There's like, you know, different how, what have people earned in terms of these stage rewards and how are they exchanging those rewards with each other to help each other to create this whole community. So it's not that you just go and you just get into and then start learning and, and don't put, you know, it's all about collaboration, communication. So we have these whole point systems. We have these different levels that we give people for their, for their advancing their journeys. We have, you know, nice gift cards when people reach certain days that they are able to qualify for those. We feel that that creates the environment and ecosystem. So I think when you, when you have a lot of people, people, people usually are okay and they want to learn, but they don't know how. But when you yeah. put a whole ecosystem around them and see all the peers taking different ways, actually then that's where magic happens. Yeah, they either don't know how or they just don't have the time. The yeah. time for learning is not prioritized. And yet we've got to do that. Um, we've got to do that. So we've covered so much ground. It's been a delight having both of you on the Data Chief. I always like to close with a question in these turbulent times, if you think about maybe beyond, of course, we value our health, our family, but um, what are you most grateful for? Um, Murali, would you like to start with that? Sure. Uh, so I feel I have the coolest job in Gilead, uh, Cindy, uh, enabling the business with data and analytics. Uh, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to uh, serve Gilead in this role. Thank you. Mahmood? Um, you know, I'm fortunate to actually work in an industry that makes a real difference and impact to patients. Um, you know, um, throughout my 25 years, I've focused on working for pharmaceutical and healthcare companies and I'm really passionate about that whatever I do, there's always an outcome, which is making lives better for patients. Yeah, um, so well said. I do think about how you both are in very much purpose-driven organizations. And so I know every listener and beyond is grateful for the very impactful work you do and for sharing your insights on the data T. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Grab. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, Cindy. Thank you.